On the final day of the COP26 climate summit in Glasgow, Scotland, India sought to change language on the use of coal, which is the biggest source of greenhouse gases. Those efforts ultimately successful, leaving many countries unhappy with the final version of the pact. Here's ABC's Ty Hernandez with the details. Following two weeks of talks at the COP26 summit in Glasgow, Scotland, nearly 200 nations adopted the controversial agreement aimed at keeping a key target alive, limiting warming to one and a half degrees Celsius. We now have uh, in place the Glasgow Climate Pact agreed amongst uh, all the parties here. This is a fragile win. Tensions rose on the final day as India proposed watering down language about the use of coal, from phasing out to phasing down. We know the old adage of negotiation, you can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. The 10-page document lays out how the world will attempt to prevent the worst impacts of climate change. We emerge from Glasgow having dramatically raised the world's ambition to solve this challenge in this decade and beyond. But there are still deep divisions, including reluctance on the part of wealthier nations to provide financial support to countries more vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. I mean, G20 is responsible for over 80 percent of global emissions. If we don't agree on reversing this, we will see more extreme weather. Reaction already pouring in. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson on Twitter calling this the moment humanity finally got real about climate change. But the executive director of Greenpeace saying the deal is weak. It doesn't meet the moment of the climate emergency. It keeps 1.5 barely alive. Should have been much bolder. Ty Hernandez, ABC News, New York. Take a look at our climate here. Absolutely perfect. Not the most exciting days to be a weather person, Katie. But uh, <laughs> that's fine with me. Okay, we, we get are like, all loving it. We get like a couple weeks of this. Yes. So. Yes. Wash yeah. and repeat. Pump that's, the brakes on exciting for now. <laughs> that's okay. Yeah, I can't complain too yeah. much. We've just really added up some nice weekends here lately and hopefully that trend will continue. The only thing I wish we could stir up a bit more of is some rain. We've got a really low chance in the week ahead, but overall pretty dry, but that does lend itself to great weekend weather, including for the rest of the weekend tomorrow. Your high temperatures today, 70s across the board, upper 70s well to the south and very close to 70 apart across parts of the hill country, but uh, what a gorgeous day. I hope you were able to get out and enjoy. We'll start to increase our afternoon highs a bit over the next several days, and by the middle of next week, we'll be back in the low to mid 80s, so it will be unseasonably warm as we get into really Tuesday, Wednesday of next week. But then look what happens. We've got, yes, another front on the horizon, and that will bring in some cooler air again for the back half of uh, of next week and uh, some cooler mornings behind that front as well. 60 now at the airport. Partly cloudy skies, but we just had a few of those high thin cirrus clouds out there, so that could be what our sensor is picking up on tonight. Overall, uh, nice and mostly clear out there. Our dew point is still on the low side, but notice our wind direction. It has started to move around a bit today, and that's what will gradually start to bring the humidity back over the next few days. Currently in the 50s across parts of the hill country, it's already down to 50 in Hondo. So Metro is staying a touch warmer for now, but down to 50 in New Braunfels and 50 in Hondo, 58 in Pleasanton, and still 63 in Del Rio. So here are our dew point numbers. This is why it felt nice and crisp out there today. Our dew points are in the 30s and 40s. But as I mentioned, our wind direction today turned around to the south, and now we've got a steady light south wind in place. But it's that change in wind direction that will really um, that will really start to bring back the humidity. I'm not going to lie. I don't really know. I don't really know what that graphic was there. That was just a blank map of Texas. So uh, there you go. So with that change in wind direction, we will start to see our dew points jump even a bit tomorrow. It won't be terribly uncomfortable outside tomorrow, but we are going to see our dew points climb for the second half of the weekend. And then early next week, they'll be up in the low 60s, so it will start to feel a little bit more muggy. But then behind this front that comes in next week, another drop in humidity. 
and also a drop in our air temperatures. As far as any rain chances go, we will carry a chance of rain with our next cold front next week, but it's just not too impressive. We won't have a lot of rain making energy to work with with the passage of this front. Nonetheless, late Wednesday night, as that front sweeps through, some isolated showers will be possible. Unfortunately, any rain that we do get likely is not going to add up to very much at all. Rainfall potential over the next week is mainly limited to areas east and south of San Antonio, and even that very low accumulations. Most of this is down in the tenth of an inch to a quarter of an inch territory. And again, this is expected to be late Wednesday as that frontal boundary moves in from the northwest down to the southeast. So we'll keep you updated on that low chance of rain, but overall pretty dry here over the next week or so. Chilly tonight, though, temperatures will continue to fall through the overnight hours down into the mid 40s by early tomorrow. We warm up back into the 70s and it will be a few degrees warmer tomorrow and also a bit more humid, not unpleasant, but a bit more humid and humidity and high temperatures will continue to rise a bit through the middle of next week before that next front takes our highs back into the 60s and 70s Thursday into Friday, guys. Right. I love those cool mornings. Thank you, Katie. All right, Andrew, uh, the road runs, road runners keeping things interesting today for that big crowd at the Alamo Dome. Yeah, it was not the kind of dominant performance you'd expect against a 1-18, and but a win is a win. When we come back, we'll show you the highlights as the defense ended up pulling out the win in this one. Plus, DGC today, Lanier faces Southside in the Bay District round. Got the highlights from that, too. Next. Thousand fans packed the dome for UTSA's first home game in nearly a month. The number 15 Roadrunners hosting Southern Miss. UTSA trailed for the better part of the second quarter, 10 to 3, until quarterback Frank Harris finds Joshua Cephas along the boundary. He makes a man miss downfield and races in for the 40-yard touchdown. And just like that, we've got a 10-10 game at halftime. Late in the third, Roadrunners down 17 to 10. Harris strikes again with a 24-yard touchdown toss to Leroy Watson. Perfect pitch and catch gets the crowd on their feet, and we're tied again at 17. The offense had some trouble moving the ball, but the defense came up big in the fourth quarter with three turnovers. Corey Mayfield Jr. gets the strip sack, and Charles Wiley recovers the fumble and returns it to the nine-yard line. And on the very next play, Sincere McCormick picks his way through the defense and fights over the goal line for the nine-yard score. UTSA breathes a sigh of relief. They are still undefeated at 10-0 with a hard-fought 27-17 victory. You know, as offense, we came out, you know, not playing up to our standard, and it's just unacceptable, um, including myself. Uh, we got to come back on Tuesday um, and just give it better. What I'm most proud of is how our coaching staff stayed so composed. Uh, the head coach stayed composed, and even though his insides were rumbling, and our leadership council stayed composed. Our single-digit guy, everybody kept a, a good blue, cool head. We never lost it, and we just stayed the course and, and got a huge, huge win. The Roadrunners are back in the Dome next Saturday. Same kickoff time against UAB. UIW looking to keep a firm grip on the inside track to the Southland Conference title with a road game against Nichols. Pick it up late third quarter. Game tied at 20. Not anymore. Kevin Brown takes the handoff, bursts through the line, and he is off to the races. No one is going to catch him. An 85-yard touchdown proves to be the game winner. Brown rushed for 185 yards and two scores on just 11 carries. And the Cardinals win it 27-23, are now 8-2 overall. Trinity is at home this afternoon looking to complete an undefeated regular season against Rhodes. Second quarter, Tigers up 27-7, and legend Grigsby adds to the lead. And his legend racing through a huge hole and weaving his way to the end zone for the 20 21 yard touchdown. Quarterback Tucker Horn throws three touchdown passes and Trinity finishes the regular season 9 and 0. They win at 55 21. Some more local scores to pass along. Texas State falls to Georgia Southern 38 to 30 and then TLU drops their season finale to Harden Simmons 65 to nothing. Only one high school football game in town this afternoon. Lanier taking on Southside in the Class 5 I by district round at the Rock Pile, and the Vokes strike first on their opening possession. Handoff goes to running back Mario Torres, following his blocking along the right side, and he is in for the 15-yard touchdown. It's 7-0 Lanier. Next Vokes possession, more offense. This time, Xavier Tejas finds Jonah Apreciado wide open for the 18-yard score. Lanier jumps out to a 14-0 lead, and they advance with a 21-14 win. Last night's by district round featured an epic shot 
shootout at Hero Stadium between New Braunfels and Johnson in Class 6A. The Unicorns led by 21 points multiple times. Quarterback Aiden Bauman threw a pair of touchdowns, but running back Riker Purdy stole the show with 23 carries for 130 yards and a whopping four touchdowns. Even though New Braunfels put 51 points on the board in this game, it wasn't over until this Johnson pass hit the turf with nine seconds left to play on fourth down. The Unicorns won the game 51-46, their first playoff victory since 2009, and they did it as part of a District 27-6A sweep as East Central, Smithson Valley, and Steele all won as well. It's everything. I mean, to do something that hasn't been done here in over 10 years, you know, it's pretty crazy. This district's really competitive and, you know, it really prepares us for games like this. You know, we've fought it for adversity, you know, this whole year and it paid off right here. It's amazing. Uh, it seems like every game we play in our district is a playoff game, so uh, we're, we're all excited. Next up, the Unicorns face Austin Westlake in the second round. The Chaparrales are 11-0 this year. Coming up later in sports, it's a good day to wear blue and orange. Brandeis is heading to the UIL State Volleyball Tournament for the first time in program history. Got highlights and reaction from the big match, guys. We'll look forward to it. Thank you, Andrew. You got it. We'll be right back. A federal grand jury has indicted former President Donald Trump's advisor Steve Bannon for contempt of Congress. Members of the House Select Committee investigating the January 6th siege at the Capitol say this should become a warning to others looking to stall their investigation. Here's ABC's Mary Alice Parks with the details. Steve Bannon is now facing federal charges for contempt of Congress after defying a congressional subpoena from the select committee investigating the January 6th siege of the Capitol. Once a top advisor to former President Trump, he's facing one charge for failing to testify and another for refusing to hand over documents requested by the committee. No one in this country, no matter how wealthy, how powerful is above the law. Bannon is a central figure in the investigation into the events of that day. House investigators pointing to his own words the day before the attack. All hell is going to break loose tomorrow. You have made this happen and tomorrow it's game day. Bannon has said that he's refused to cooperate at the direction of former President Trump, citing executive privilege, a president's right to have confidential communications. But the Justice Department, in its announcement, made specific reference to the fact that Bannon had been a private citizen since leaving the White House in 2017, arguing that there was no reason he should be able to ignore Congress. The select committee saying this should be a warning, writing no one is above the law. We will not hesitate to use the tools at our disposal to get the information we need. Bannon is not the only one currently defying Congress. The committee now says it's also considering holding former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows in contempt of Congress after he failed to show up to testify before the committee Friday. Meadows' lawyer said that he would not participate until questions around former President Trump's executive privilege claims were answered in court. Bannon is expected to self-surrender to law enforcement and have his first court appearance on Monday. If found guilty on both charges, he could face up to two years in prison plus fines. Mary Alice Parks, ABC News, Washington. In coronavirus news, President Biden's vaccine mandate for companies with more than 100 employees is still being halted by a federal appeals court. But health officials continue to stress the importance of getting vaccinated, especially as temperatures drop. Here's ABC's Elwin Lopez with the details. A federal appeals court has halted the Biden administration's vaccine or weekly testing requirement for businesses with 100 or more workers, calling the mandate staggeringly overbroad. This delivering a setback to one of the president's signature public health policies. The decision comes as health officials prepare for a possible surge of COVID cases as temperatures drop. It's happening in cold states like Minnesota and, and Colorado and Illinois. This Delta variant is, is ripping through the unvaccinated populations in those states to begin with. And then it will continue to accelerate as we move into the winter. In Colorado, one out of every 48 residents is infected with COVID. We still are in a very dire situation. We wouldn't even be here talking about this if, if everybody was vaccinated. And across the country, hospitalizations are on the rise for the fourth consecutive day. 47,000 patients now receiving care. Unfortunately, we're just not out of the woods yet. We have to have a healthy level of caution as we're stepping into this holiday season. Medical experts say several factors may be contributing to the rising numbers. The vast majority of hospitalizations are still among the unvaccinated, but we are seeing waning immunity. Four states now offering booster shots for all adults, even before the CDC gives the go-ahead 
for that added dose of protection. That if you think you will benefit from getting a booster shot, I encourage you to go out and get it. Supplies available. So far, no word on when the FDA and the CDC will make the decision to extend boosters to all adults. Elwin Lopez, ABC News, New York. Just six days after the U.S. reopened to fully vaccinated international travelers, new lockdowns are being put in place in parts of Europe. In the Netherlands, more than 16,000 cases reported in a 24-hour period, forcing a three-week partial lockdown. Bars, restaurants, and supermarkets will now close at 8 p.m. Professional sports again will be played in empty stadiums. Meanwhile, the Austrian chancellor is set to implement a lockdown for the unvaccinated in two regions and is poised to move forward with similar measures nationwide. And in Germany, where COVID cases have hit a string of new highs, people are being urged once again to cancel or avoid large events. Bad news for bargain hunters. Good luck, good luck trying to snag some designer brands at your favorite discount stores right now. The problem continues. That's the global supply chain issue. Discount chains like TJ Maxx, Burlington, and Ross often carry these the excess of those premium apparel and shoes for lower prices. Brands like Under Armour, Ralph Lauren, Carter's, and Steve Madden are saying they're stepping away from those discount chains. They say it's the least profitable outlet, and it's also diluting the brand image. We'll be right back. For the first time in more than a decade, Britney Spears is making her own decisions about her life and finances. Yeah, this after her conservatorship, formerly controlled by her father, was dissolved after a judge's decision. ABC's Zareen Shah is in Los Angeles, Los Angeles with the star's reaction to being freed. This morning, pop superstar Britney Spears is waking up a free woman. A judge ending the nearly 14 year conservatorship, which controlled her life and $60 million fortune. This is a monumental day for Britney Spears. A California judge ruling Friday the conservatorship is not required anymore after Britney's lawyer said safeguards were in place to protect the entertainer professionally and personally. The conservatorship was put into place amid a bitter divorce and custody battle in 2008. Britney then breaking her silence in June, pushing for a conservatorship to end, calling it abusive, telling the court she'd been exploited, embarrassed and demoralized by the people behind it. Outside the courthouse in Los Angeles, an army of fans breaking out in celebration. When people are down, you got to go and pick them up. And she was our star, so we came to pick her right back up. I moved here from New York to be a part of this fight, to stand up for what's right. After the announcement, Brittany posting on Instagram, Good God, I love my fans so much, it's crazy. I think I'm going to cry the rest of the day. Best day ever. Praise the Lord. Can I get an amen? Hashtag freed Brittany. And that was Zareen Shah reporting. Brittany has previously said she wants her dad to face some consequences for all of this. Legal experts say to do that, she would have to start an entire all new civil lawsuit. All right, taking another look outside tonight. It's been a beautiful day, clear and cool tonight. Pretty crisp as well. You notice a little more humidity tomorrow, but overall pretty comfortable. Take a look at high temperatures across the U.S. today. 71 here in San Antonio and compared to some 30s up near the Great Lakes and low 90s in Southern California, we were kind of sitting right in the middle, sitting pretty if you ask me. So a little warmer tomorrow, a little more humidity. We'll talk more about your Sunday forecast and get you an overall look at our weather pattern over the next week or so coming up in just a few minutes. All right, Thanksgiving is less than two weeks away, but it's already beginning to look a lot like Christmas in New York City. The Rockefeller Center Christmas tree officially arrived in the Big Apple today. It's a 12 ton, 20, 79 foot Norway spruce from Elkton, Maryland. The tree will be lit up for the first time of the season on December 1st. Have fun decorating that one. My gosh, it always scares me. Like, 
how high do those ladders have to be? Are they I, I scaffolding? Think they, I think they use cranes okay. for those, actually. <laughs> but all I know is it's not my problem. It's not my problem there. <laughs> it's all, we just like to look at the finished product. Yeah, That's exactly. Right. And it's, uh, it's always a beautiful sight. Seems obviously. like it's all coming so fast right now. After we hit Halloween, it's just like a fast <laughs> downward slide into the new year. It is. Poof, gone in a flash. <laughs> yep, definitely. Um, and I know it's still a little bit early for some folks, but let's just say you were starting to put up your Christmas decorations. Is this hypothetical? Yes. Okay. Oh, it's not hypothetical. <laughs> I have lots of friends on Facebook, and they've and all one in the studio. been doing it. <laughs> and one in the studio. <laughs> Me. Um, so let's just say that. <laughs> let's just say that was in your plans. For tomorrow, I mean, the weather is going to be really nice. So if you just wanted to kind of check that off your list, there's our little snowman inflatable. Sarah Spivey put this graphic together. I love it so much. Uh, so if that is in your planes tomorrow, the weather will be pleasant. It will be a little bit warmer tomorrow afternoon. Our highs for a lot of us will jump into the upper 70s, even some low 80s down to the south and to the west. But overall, a day with some light winds, a good amount of sunshine. So if you do need to spend some time outdoors, whether that be holiday decorations or just yard work, uh, tomorrow will be a pretty good day for it. 60 now at the airport, but outside of the metro, it's already starting to get a good bit cooler. We're at 53 in Kerrville, 50 in Hondo, still in the low 60s in Catula. Felt great today, felt great yesterday because of lower humidity, and our dew points really bottomed out late last night and early this morning. They're in the 30s and the 40s. That is feeling nice and dry. What will happen though as we get into the day tomorrow, these new point numbers are going to start to come up just a bit. Our wind direction moved around to the south today and that will start to pull back in some moisture from the Gulf of Mexico. Even by tomorrow morning, not a whole lot of change, but more of us with dew points jumping into the 40s. And then I do expect by tomorrow afternoon, tomorrow evening, more of us will have dew points in the 50s. So that's still feeling fairly pleasant. You're not going to walk outside tomorrow and be hit with a wall of humidity, but you will notice little bit more humidity to the air tomorrow and this trend will continue into Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of next week before our next front arrives late Wednesday and by early Thursday. So after a few days of higher humidity by Thursday next week, our dew points will drop once again behind our next cold front. So we'll get a nice refreshing push of some cooler, drier air behind our next front next week. As far as rain chances go, though, they are quite slim, just a low chance of some isolated rain with this front passing through late Wednesday night, early on Thursday. And this is very reflective of a typical La Nina weather pattern, which is what we're heading into for the late fall and winter months in a typical typical La Nina pattern during the winter. Jet streams, both the polar jet stream and the Pacific jet stream are up across the northern tier of the country. So that typically prevents a lot of the cooler air and also any good rain making energy from dropping farther south. And that usually paints a drier and warmer winter overall for us. And just a caveat there, that's not to say we'll never get any rain. That's not to say it will never get cold. But overall, in a La Nina weather pattern, things typically trend drier and warmer for us. And you can almost kind of see that here on satellite and radar. There's some snow um, closer to the Great Lakes there, some precip from Omaha over to St. Louis, and even some precip up in the Pacific Northwest. But across the southern tier of the country, things are very, very quiet and that's because the low pressure systems, the active weather is all across the northern half of the U.S. And this generally will continue all the way into next week. Here's the low that's going to drag that front through our area late Wednesday, early Thursday. All the good energy, though, is just displaced too far north. So that's what's going to keep our rain chances at a minimum with the passage of our next front next week. So hopefully we can stir up some better rain chances for you soon. Heading into the overnight hours for a lot of us temperatures drop down into the 40s. So we'll start off on the cool side tomorrow morning. A lot of sunshine though. A south wind will warm us up a bit more tomorrow afternoon. Look for a high around 77 here in San Antonio. Some low to mid 80s down to the southwest. Low 80s for highs through the middle of the week and then a bit cooler back half of next week behind that front. Guys, I'll take it. Thanks, Katie. Mm -hmm. All right, I know, Andrew, you're going to talk about other things in this tease, but I think we should say if you're friends with a Longhorn <laughs> alum or fan, <laughs> check on them. They're not okay I'm tonight. I'm out of here. <laughs> Oh, man, yeah, no, that's it's been a rough day for the Aggies and Longhorns fans. We'll come back. We'll talk about both of those games. The Longhorns game just ended 
The Aggies one has been over for a while, and it was a rough one to watch. We'll show you what happened to both of those teams. Plus, Brandeis Volleyball punched their ticket to state for the first time in program history, and they are thrilled about it. Got the highlights next. It was another huge SEC showdown for number 11 Texas A&M tonight, this time on the road against number 12 Ole Miss. Aggies down 15-3 in the third quarter. Handoff goes to Devon A-Chain. He finds a crease, takes off down the sideline, and barrels in for the 25-yard touchdown. A&M is right back in it, down 15-10. Fourth quarter now, trailing 15-13. Zach Calzada fires left side, but the ball is tipped and intercepted by Ashanti Sistrunk at the 14-yard line. A huge turnover gets converted into points two plays later. Snoop Connor races in for the 13-yard score, and that is the dagger. A&M falls 29-19. Close your eyes, Courtney. Longhorns looking to get back to 500 this evening with a home game against Kansas, and it ain't looking good late in the first half. Hudson Card in at quarterback, and he is picked off by Jacoby Bryant. That's going to be a 30-yard pick six. Jayhawks led 35-14 at halftime, but Texas roars all the way back. Casey Thompson now in. He goes deep for Cade Brewer, and he hauls it in for the 25-yard touchdown. We are tied at 49 and heading to overtime. Both teams score touchdowns, but Kansas decides to go for two in the win, and Jalen Daniels finds Jared Casey for the game-winning conversion. Texas falls 57-56 to in overtime. Top 25 showdown elsewhere in the Big 12. Number 18, Baylor hosting number four, Oklahoma. Fourth quarter, Bears up 17-7. to Gary Bohannon keeps it himself on the read option, gets a block, and cuts back for the 14-yard score. Baylor shocks the Sooners and hands them their first loss, 27-14. San Antonio FC in the Western Conference semifinals against their South Texas rival RGV FC and the home team opens the scoring in the first half. Jose Gallegos puts a shot on goal. It's saved, but Santiago Patino puts home the rebound. It's 1-0 SAFC in the 24th minute. And for the first time in franchise history, SAFC is heading to the Western Conference final. They win it. 3-1. First the state on the line this afternoon in the Volleyball Regional Finals. Class 6A, Brandeis taking on Austin Vandegrift at a jam-packed Alamo Convocation Center. Broncos up 2-0 in sets and rolling in the third. Jalen Gibson brings the hammer down. And then a few plays later, Carly Ferris finds Emma Halstead for a blast right down the middle. And Brandeis leads 13-11. That's when the Broncos take control with a 9-0 run. Austin Smoke gets it to fall inbounds on the runner. And then on match point, Halstead Spike hits off the dig and out. Look at the reaction here. Brandeis sweeps the Vipers. They are moving on to state for the excuse me, uh, moving on to state for the first time in program history. Three sets to none. Honestly, just pure excitement, nothing else. Just knowing that we came out and did what we planned to do and we've executed and we broke this barrier that we haven't been able to in past years. So proud of our girls, you know, like each and every person has played such a big role. Like our bench's energy feeds into what we do out here. And, you know, we just would give it all for each and every person. And, you know, not many teams can say that. The Class 6A state semifinals begin next Friday night in Garland. New Braunfels Canyon is heading to state as well. The Cougarettes swept Dripping Springs in the Class 5A regional final at Northside Sports Gym this afternoon to punch their tickets. This marks Canyon's first state tournament appearance since they were in Class 6A back in 2015. Last match of the afternoon, Class 4A regional final between Wimberley and Needville at Littleton Gym. Texans looking for their second straight trip to state. This one went to a fifth set and Wimberley takes the lead. First, Paige Crawford smokes a kill right down the middle. 5-4 to four Texans. And then Ellie Marco finds Cameron Davis for a shot off the block and down. Wimberley actually led 11-7, four points away from advancing, but Needville closed on an 8-1 to one run, and Wimberley falls short of a return to state, three sets to two. Spurs back in action tomorrow. Cowboys and Texans as well. Got a lot to cover on Instant Replay coming up tomorrow at 11 p.m. Guys? Thank you, Andrew. We'll be right back. We used up all of our time. No something good tonight, but the something good is we were on time. So yes, we were watching. on time. <laughs> be sure to catch be sure to catch GMSA tomorrow starting at six. Have a great night. See you tomorrow.